Cool. Let's get well, started. <coughs> um, so this lecture will have uh, no impact on any of the remaining assignments or the uh, final. It's simply a survey of advanced topics for your personal, personal enrichment. If you, and if you, in case you find any of these topics interesting, many of these topics are the subject of contemporary research in machine learning and related fields to machine learning, such as optimization, statistics, and so forth. And so you may, if you find those interesting, you may be interested in pursuing some research in these directions. Oops. Okay. okay, so first I just wanna highlight what we covered. Uh, so the first half of this course was uh, really looking at sort of the fundament, some of the fundamentals that, are, that underlie the pragmatic types of machine learning that are used in companies uh, across the world. And that is largely in the realm of supervised learning and things related to it such as overfitting, the choice of loss functions, whether you use a linear model or a nonlinear model, the extent to which the nonlinear models can be viewed as representation learning. We also looked at concepts in, in unsupervised learning where we covered things like uh, concepts like dimension data reduction, reconstruction error, and then we also covered things like probabilistic model. And so, you know, it's, this, is, this is very much a survey style course, so we didn't really go super in depth on any particular area. And of course, you know, overfitting, for example, is a topic that was the subject of a lot of research, and, and still is, in fact. Um, you know, how to characterize overfitting in deep neural nets is actually a really hard concept to reason about. And so today, we'll look at just a survey of some of the other uh, topics that. Um, Know, are closer to contemporary research. Um, so yeah, this is the basic supervised learning setting. Um, this is the basic unsupervised learning setting. We cover deep learning. We cover <coughs> sequence prediction and probabilistic models. And we covered simple optimization algorithms. And a few other basic concepts. And I would say that the stuff that we covered in class uh, up, to, up until now, uh, by and large, is sort of the, the meat and potatoes of what, how you use machine learning in, in, the, in the real world for the majority of the applications that you, you, you've seen machine learning be successful. And so you should all consider yourselves to be um, working machine learning engineers uh, for, all, for all intents and purposes. Uh, of course, there are more things to learn, but I think everything you learn in this class will get you off the ground. Okay, topic one, learning theory. So learning theory is concerned with generalization. So it tries to establish, or at least one branch of learning theory, it is concerned with generalization bounds. It tries to establish a formal characterization of overfitting. So here's an example result. So if we train a model, I'll call this model H, then a, 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 a typical guarantee that we would like to see in, in, in generalization error uh, analysis is that with probability is one minus delta, where delta is some error tolerance. For example, you can think of delta as 0 0.01, 0 0.001, something like that. Then the expected uh, auto sample error, so this is the test error, um, is no greater than the training error plus this, uh, this term, which is the generalization value. And this is a simplified uh, example of such a bound that one can hope to prove. And it basically says that it's, it's sort of on the order of log over 1 minus delta, which means uh, this term blows up to infinity as delta goes to zero. And divided by the square root of the training size, assuming that the training set is sampled IID from the out of sample, the test set. And so if you squint, this looks a lot like, a, for example, like a Gaussian confidence interval, where you know, the, the confidence ratio, or the, 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 conf, the, 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 so the confidence margin, like 95% and 99%. It is sort of determined by this log of one minus delta. Uh, for, for a specific Gaussian, for example, uh, one standard deviation, which is one over square root of n times the standard deviation, um, uh, times, the, me, times, the, uh, times the unnormalized standard deviation, is, um, is 67%, so delta would be 0.33, something like that. Two standard deviations, so the, the coefficient was two up here, it would be something like 95%, so delta would be 0.05. And three standard deviations is like 0.99, something like that, right? And so this is just a, just this is a, this is a, um, this this type of analysis is 
is distribution independent. You're only assuming, um, typically you assume something like sub-Gaussian noise tails and independence of the random variables. And so it's not necessarily specific to the noise distribution being specifically Gaussian. This is sort of what we can say. And, and one of the things you can see here is that, um, let's see, yeah, uh, is that you know, as we get more data, then this bound gets tighter, right? In the, in the limit of infinite data, assuming the data is sampled IID from the test distribution, these two quantities are basically equal. Because this goes to zero. Uh, in the limit, as delta goes to zero, so we want 100% we want confidence. We want perfect precision that will, in terms of our estimate, uh, in, in terms of confidence, then this numerator part goes to infinity. And so that's sort of the, the, the tension that we have here. And we have this tension in science as well. So you know, these confidence intervals based on the central limit theorem uh, that people use in science to report whether or not something is statistically significant also has this issue where if you want to be perfectly confident, 100% confident, then the confidence bars go to, go to infinity. So uh, one classical example that people use to analyze uh, this term. So you know, right now, what this is, right now this term is super simplified, right? There are a lot of constants inside this big O that I've just suppressed. For example, there's no dependence here on the complexity class of your function class, like the degrees of freedom of your function class. And clearly, we know from you know, some of the experiments and homeworks in the beginning of the class that uh, the complexity of the function class makes a big difference, like linear versus quadratic versus cubic. We need so there's, there's must, there must be something in this big O that we need to sort of analyze more rigorously in order to say how this thing deviates depending on linear versus quadratic versus cubic. And so one concept that can help us characterize this for a function class, at least a linear function class, is a notion known as shatter. So a set of data points is shattered by, a, by hypothesis class H. If for all possible binary labelings of those points, there exists some H in capital H that classifies it perfectly. So for two-dimensional binary classification with linear models, where capital H is the class of all 2D linear models, then for any uh, possible labeling you know, of a set of data points, then if, if you, no matter how you label it, uh, in terms of the labels, you can classify it perfectly. That means that it's shattered by H. Okay? So in 2D, for linear models, any set of three points can always be shattered by linear models. You pick any set of three points in 2D, you label them plus or minus with binary labels, any way you like, there always exists a linear model that can shatter that, get perfect accuracy. Now, and this is not true for four, so this is a very simple counterexample just to keep things concrete. So uh, uh, a, a set of four data points in 2D cannot be shattered by linear models. The simple example is the XOR, which is basically what we represented here. There doesn't exist a linear model that can shatter this labeling. So what, in other words, in 2D, linear models cannot shatter four points. So the VC dimension of a hypothesis class is the most number of points that can be shattered by this hypothesis class. So if H is the class of linear models in a 2D feature space, then the VC dimension of H is three. And so here's just one bound that you can prove. Uh, you can say that if, uh, you know, if, if H, if, if I'm learning an H over capital H, uh, then the uh, generalization error, so the out of sample test error, is less than or equal to the training error, plus this term, and this term now depends on the square root of the VC dimension of H, and, this, and the other terms that you see. So what this means is that as the number of data points increases, this bound gets tighter and tighter, and we show that we're overfitting less and less. As our confidence interval, as our confidence requirement increases, then um, this bound gets looser and looser. And as the VC dimension of our hypothesis class increases, this bound gets looser and looser. So this is a formal characterization of in some sense, the bias variance trade-off, right? The bias variance trade-off is, at least the way we covered it in class, is some intuitive notion of the complexity of the function class. Uh, and 
versus you know, uh, how much training data we have. That, that's the way we think about the bias virus trade-off. And then when we do model selection to optimize the bias virus trade-off, we're choosing a function class that intuitively uh, you know, optimizes this bound, right? Sorry, optimizes this guy versus this guy, excuse me. So this guy gets lower and lower when models with lower bias. And this guy gets higher and higher with models with lower bias because the variance typically increases because the complexity class of the function class increases. Is there a question? No? Okay. And so this is just one way to actually formally write down a, a concrete, mathematically rigorous bound that characterizes bias variance trade off and overfitting. Of course, you can argue that this bound might be loose or this bound is, is the perfect characterization, but this is the type of analyses that people with statistical learning theory uh, look at. Any questions on that? Uh, just one comment on how these bounds are typically proven. They're typically proven by, uh, by, by martingale analysis. If you know about martingale analysis, it's a sequence of random variables whose expectation is equal to, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sequence of random variables whose expected value of the next random variable, given the observation of the previous ones, is equal to the uh, previous. Uh, and so, uh, from the martingale, from, if you if you write down the training the training data the collection process as a martingale process, then you could apply things like uh, Azuma Hufting's inequality, and that's the that's how we actually get these types of bounds. So, uh, um, a topic of contemporary research in machine learning is at, is at analysis of generalization in deep learning. So, the VC dimension uh, that I just showed you, even though it's a sort of a, a, a classic and very cherished result in statistical learning theory, it does not appear to be a very good characterization of deep learning. In particular, the VC dimension of a deep neural net is huge. It's gigantic. And yet, and so these bounds are basically just vacuous. And yet, deep neural nets tend to generalize pretty well. Better than you would expect if you were to trust these bounds as sort of type. Furthermore, um, uh, something that a lot of people are studying these days is the interplay between optimization and generalization. Now, deep neural nets typically lead, uh, the training of deep neural nets typically lead to a non-convex optimization problem. And so there are multiple local minima. And so uh, a lot of people are looking at how some local, local minima seem to be better than others in terms of generalization error. So you, get, you get two local minima, they give you the exact same training error. Typically, uh, for, for simple data sets, they, it's zero, literally zero training error. So they both, they both classify the training examples perfectly, and yet one has much better test error than the other. And some people have tried to analyze this from looking at the geometry of the, uh, of the optimization landscape. So this is a topic of current research. I'm just gonna go through these really fast. So if there are any questions, just stop. Yeah. I mean, what is interesting about the local geometry? So it's an open question. So I, I, and I, I don't personally work in this area, so I'm gonna probably butcher butcher it. But the general idea is that some people think that if you get a local minima that's flat versus a local minima that's peaked, even though both get zero training error, you're fitting the training error perfectly. The flat one will generalize better. And that's an intuition some people have, and for very like. Simplified versions of neural nets, such as those with only one hidden layer, you can you can actually say something rigorous. It's unclear if those intuitions and the partial results carry over the deep neural nets, or when the classification error is not zero. So yeah, here's a here's a yeah here's a very simple setup. I have a very simple train, uh, classification problem. My neural all my neural net can easily get zero of training error. Right? And there are multiple local so all the local minima are global minima. Because I know it's low, I know it's lower, I know the objective function is lower bounded by zero. Okay. Which one? Okay, so they all get zero training error. Which one has better test error? So that's a, and then if you restrict yourself to two layer neural nets, some people have shown some partial results that seems to suggest that uh, local minima that have flatter geometry, like a basin of local minima, rather than a very sharp local minima, like a non robust local minima, if you will, seem to generalize better. That's in parameter space. So. Uh, in the parameter space of the neural. Yeah. Now, uh, other people will tell you, will, will probably say that, oh, these results don't make sense, they're making too many assumptions that aren't realistic for real neural nets. 
so, so it's an open question, right? Um, but, but those are the types of partial results that some people have gotten in this, in this area. Okay, structure prediction. So structure prediction uh, pertains of making predictions in complex output spaces. Uh, the example that we looked at in class is part of speech tagging, where we're given an input sequence, and we need to predict an output sequence. Uh, this problem also appears in, for example, um, processing other kinds of sequences, like DNA sequences, where we want to tag the DNA sequence as introns versus exons or something else. Um, that, uh, parsing is another output space where the input is a string, but the output is actually a parse tree or a syntax tree of that string. Um, ranking, so the input is a query, the output is a permutation of some set of objects. So now I'm mapping x to a permutation over a bunch of y's. And you know, many real world problems have these structured forms from like topic things in natural language processing, like co-reference clustering, uh, you know, folding structure of Molecule, uh, proteins, uh, theorem proving, you know, uh, stereo vision. These are all cases where the prediction, you're making predictions over multiple variables at the same time, and you want, there, you want to model some sort of relationship between the different variables that you're predicting. And so typically, these type of predictions require optimization. So in inner markup models, the optimization procedure was dynamic programming. And in fact, many of these, many of these uh, problems you can solve using dynamic programming. What, another implication is that learning requires making predictions. So if you think about all the learning that we've done in this class, uh, they are, they're all implicitly making a prediction during learning. So for neural nets, you make a prediction, and then you back prop. The gradient is a function of the, of the current prediction of the neural net. Now, because it's only doing classification, this is a very simple thing to, to compute. But if your prediction lives in a combinatorial output space, computing the prediction requires running, let's say, a dynamic programming solution. And then we, we compute a gradient if it, uh, through a dynamic programming solution. So this is actually very complicated. Um, uh, so for example, for HMMs, we didn't use the gradient step, we used EM. But the E step requires running the alpha uh, Running the four backward algorithm, which is a dynamic program algorithm, in order to uh, compute the uh, model updates. So, more generally, these types of structured prediction problems, they all have this interplay where the prediction task is non trivial and requires running some optimization algorithm. And the learning requires running a prediction task. And so, for example, um, people study things like okay, so maybe if I just run an approximate dynamic programming, then it won't give me the right answer. But that's okay because I know my model's really wrong right now because the parameters are off. So an approximate solution won't be any worse than computing the exact solution given these wrong models. All I need is a noisy gradient that points me in the right direction. So maybe I just run approximate dynamic programming, get a really approximate answer with my with my very imperfect model parameters. Because and would that be good? That's good because I can very cheaply get a gradient. For, whereas the running the full dynamic programming solution could take hundred times longer, and my gradient's not any better because the model parameters are really bad. So the trade-off between what's called inference, which is making a prediction, and learning in these structured prediction settings is also a topic of contemporary research. Yes? How much do people have to worry about the bias of those approximations? Like, is there some amount of bias that then you can't? That's a, great, that's a great question. So this also comes up with learning probabilistic models. So for example, if I want to do sampling to estimate the parameters of my probabilistic model, and I want to do sampling faster, Right? Then there's a bias variance trade off there. So the answer to your question is yes. Yeah. So typically, what people do, and again, the theory of this is a bit vague because it's very, it's a very complicated system. But intuitively, the, the kind of algorithms people design, they run, if, if you're doing ADP, approximate dynamic programming, then your uh, approximation criteria gets sharper and sharper as the model gets trained better. For example. So a process dynamic programming typically means instead of doing the full dynamic programming solution, I just sample a few traces and I pick the best one. That's, that's in a nutshell what a process dynamic programming is. Because the, pro the full dynamic programming solution is like, even for sequences, it's like the number of states by states squared. So it's the number of states squared times the length, which can be very expensive for large prediction tasks. 
other things that happen is, okay, so right now this, we're just encoding sort of these, these known structural dependencies in these constraints to create these structured output spaces that are combinatorial and large. We can also use this as a platform to think about other forms of constraints that we have, that, excuse me, might arise in other types of uh, domains. So, and that leads us uh, to uh, a brief uh, uh, introduction to CAST, which is a new center at Caltech. It stands for the Center for Autonomous Systems and Technologies. Uh, it's basically um, you know, things that are related to robotics and uh, autonomous systems and smart grids and spacecrafts and, and uh, real world systems that require improved autonomy. So it's also a collaboration with JPL. And at CAST, uh, you know, we work on autonomous dynamic robots, uh, things from swarms of drones, bipedal robots, 3D printers, um, space simulated spacecrafts, exoskeletons. This is a wind fan that can generate uh, very complex wind uh, wind patterns and vortices, and trying to design systems uh, that can behave well while learning about this type of environment. And again, you can imagine there's a lot of structure here, right? You know, uh, the structure here is very different from like a part of speech tagging structure, but you can very clearly see that if I have a bipedal robot. I want to do walking, there's a constraint of one foot on the ground at a time. Just a, and that's a very simple constraint. So how do we code those constraints as in, how do we code those things into a new kind of structure and then do learning to, to train our controllers for these uh, systems that are more optimal in whatever optimality condition you care about. Energy efficiency, speed, whatever. And so that leads us to sort of the, the research part of this center, at least my involvement with it, um, which is blending learning and control. So optimal control, uh, in a nutshell, um, is the, the goal of optimal control is to design a controller that achieves some sort of goal in the dynamical system typically expressed as a PDE. Um, and so this, the, the design of this controller is typically optimization based. Dynamic programming, if some sort of iterative linearization, repeated iterative linearization, so on and so forth. So at this level, if I were to squint, just, just, just squint, it looks a lot like a structured prediction problem at, at, at a certain level of mathematical abstraction. Right? Um, if we need, especially if we need to learn something about this dynamical system and then run dynamic programming to solve for the solution, it starts to look a lot like a structured prediction problem. Very different in terms of the specifics of the structure we're part of speech tagging, but nonetheless, we, have to learn, we need to learn part of the dynamical system, and then we, we compute the, the our, our, our predictor is running dynamic programming uh, on that learned dynamical system. And so, you know, the, we have some uh, results in this space uh, over the past year. So this is just one application where we're trying to train a neural net-based controller to automatically and gracefully land a drone. This is actually a notoriously hard problem because of the so-called ground effect. So the ground effect basically says that as, you, as, as the drone or any object interacting with aerodynamics, also like, I guess this also works for submarines underwater, underwater crafts too, but in, in aerodynamics, if you get close to a boundary, in this case the ground, the aerodynamics change. And in particular, it changes in a way that's very, very difficult to model. And so what a drone controller that's pretty decent in open air flight becomes very bad in near, near boundary flight. And so uh, most consumer drones that you could buy, they have a handcrafted controller for landing that gets sort of close to the ground and they just shuts off and crashes into the ground. And they just live with that. And so we actually trained a neural net to, um, to learn the ground effect, so learn part of the PDE. <laughs> And then we applied uh, iterative linearization-based controller design, and then we could able to we were able to land the drone gracefully. So that's the right bit of animation. And furthermore, um, people who study control systems, uh, they they try to do things like analyze that this controller uh, will. Know, main, uh, keep the, uh, the, the agent uh, within some sort of stabilizing region. Um, this is how we prove that, for example, your airplane won't crash under normal air net conditions. And so we could actually, one nice aspect of this work is that if you can blend the math the right way, 
you can actually preserve all those theoretical guarantees. So we actually prove that this drone will not crash, even though it has a neural net black box inside of it. I'm going to move on. Any questions? Yes? Uh, was this supervised or unsupervised? Supervised. And so what data did you use? So the data, so we, um, so the supervision, so a dynamical system is a control, a controlled dynamical system, is, or actuated dynamical system, is uh, the derivative of the, of the change in state, which in this case is the so yeah, the state of this drone is, I think it's like 12 dimensional, so the x, y, z, and you know, stuff like that. Also, it's, it's, the, it's the standard description of the drone plus the derivative. So it's 12, I think it's 12 dimensional. So x, y, z, then some, some angle thing, and then it's derivatives, 12 dimensions. So that's the state, okay? Uh, a differential equation says that the derivative of the state is equal to f. The derivative of f f of x is equal to f of x. That's a, that's a differential equation. A, an actuated differential equation is the derivative of x is equal to f of x comma a, where a is my action. In this case, the action is how fast you're spinning the, each of the four rotor moments. And so if you knew that f perfectly, you could run various optimization algorithms to, to compute the right controller, dynamic programming, the linearization. But if you don't know f, you have to learn it, or at least learn part of it. And so what is that f? The supervised learning is what is the type, what is the derivative of the state as a function of the current state and the current action. So the, so the input is the current state, the current action, and the target is the derivative. And that's the supervised learning model. <laughs> yeah, you have a human fly the drone up and down a little bit, close to the ground, um, and you collect the data and you learn to trade these. Uh, so. How yes. How uh, yeah, just go. Yeah. Okay. So did you train it on like the, the original data or train it to learn like the residuals of the PID? We learned the residuals. So, so otherwise you don't get the theoretical guarantees. So in the original differential equation, um, you have a model of the drone, it's overly simplified. In addition to not modeling the ground effect, it doesn't model things like the wobble of the drone. It's because the drone wobbles when it flies. And we're not modeling that. We assume the drone is uniform mass. The mass the mass density is uniform, which is not true. And, all, and we assume the drone is in a box, also not true. And there's all these assumptions we make about in the, in the model that aren't true. You can learn all those residuals using the drone. So you're saying that the data is um, the human behavior of the control, right? In this particular experiment, yes. Yeah, so if you were to use this at a, uh, if you were a drone company, you wanted to design a super smooth and graceful drone landing controller, rather than like manually trying to like design the lander, what you would do is you would just take your drone and joystick it for, for in this case, six minutes, and then you could train this model. So the train is not the controller itself, but um, a set of behavior that how it lands, right? Uh, so the controller here is a function that makes a decision based off a model. Right. So in HMM, so in hidden Markov models, we want to make a decision like the turby, right? We want to or, or give it our current model. Yeah. So your decision could be: I want to predict the most likely sequence of variables. I want to predict the marginal distributions. Those are all decisions we want to do. Here, the decision is to design a control sequence that stabilizes to some desired point of this differential equation. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna move on to crowdsourcing. So, in many applications, the dirty secret, or it's not, it's not like a secret, uh, the dirty trick of supervised learning is that we need labels. And for many applications, these labels come from annotators. And so one of the things that's kind of, in some ways, in some ways it's empowering, in some ways it's unpleasant, about supervised learning for many applications is that, okay, we're just gonna hire a bunch of people to annotate this data. Oh, is this a restaurant, yes or no? Or you know, whatever. If you've ever used Google Maps and you go to a restaurant and then ask you if you're available to answer a bunch of questions, they're, they're, they're collecting supervised labels from your <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, Amazon Academy Turk is a, is a crowd-working platform that is very popular in the learning community and, and AI community in general. 
uh, where we basically uh, pay people to annotate stuff. So okay, this suddenly opens up a can of whole, whole new can of worms. We can no longer trust these labels as ground truth. I, I don't know. And like, there's some anonymous person with a user ID that I'm paying, you know, some some amount of money per hour to provide me labels. Okay. Or Google asked me to 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 to, to answer. Does this restaurant have a parking have a good parking situation? <coughs> yes or no. And I might just pick an answer. That happens. I think we've all done it. I'm not ashamed to say that I have. <laughs> and so, this, so, so the moment you don't, the moment that the whys are not ground truth, gold star, gold standard labels, it opens up a whole new can of worms, right? So, how do I label annotators? Well, okay, if we knew what the ground truth labels are, kind of defeats the purpose of this exercise. But as a thought experiment, if we knew how good the label, what the labels were, we can judge each worker on its quality, on their quality. How reliable is this worker? If we knew who the perfect workers were, then we could create labels only using their annotations and discard the labels from the poor workers or do some weighted averaging. So it's a chicken and egg problem, at least with the way I presented it right now. Oh, man. I have it myself. Okay. So, okay, so here's one super simple approach. This is a fairly common base, baseline approach. Let Z sub M develop the reliability worker out. And then the label is simply the weighted average of the, of the labels by my workers weighted by their reliability. Seems like a pretty sensible first thing point to do. And then the reliability of a worker is equal to, the reliability of the worker is equal to the average loss of that worker versus my current estimate of the ground truth. So I estimate my ground truth as a weighting function of the labels provided by my workers, weighted by their liability, then I estimate that my workers' reliability by measuring their loss against my current estimate of the ground truth. This is the EM algorithm, and this is a very common baseline that people use. There are many ways to extend this, multi-dimensional expertise, rather than just a unit dimension, uh, one-dimensional expertise, and so on and so forth. You can measure, so yeah, there are many ways you can extend this, um, yeah, so the EM algorithm. Um, People extend this, like, if the worker has been annotating, you can put a timestamp on the annotation. If the worker has been annotating for like 10 in a row, maybe they're tired, you, know, you can estimate fatigue. You can estimate multi-dimensional reliability, not just a single dimensional reliability. So you can, you can estimate how much you're paying this worker as a function of payment, stuff like that. But this is the basic model. Yeah, so um, there's also ambiguities across tasks, so different labeling tasks um, might, have, might have different levels of ambiguities. Um, one question you could ask is, well, okay, how many labels do I, do I collect for each task? Do I collect 10 labels and compute their average? Do I collect 100 labels? Do I just collect one? How many should I collect? Other questions include things like structured annotations. So, you know, here's an image, and I want to do segmentation. Of all the object, of all the foreground objects in this image, do I do full supervision? In which case, I have to ask someone to label every single pixel. <coughs> do I do image level supervision, where I ask people to label, uh, just label the, the people? <coughs> do I do point level supervision, where I just ask people to, to label a point inside the, with, inside the, the, the segmentation of each person? So it becomes very complicated. It's, Actually, it starts to become, there's, human psychology becomes involved to some degree. Um, if, if you do like point, if you do like full supervision, you know, the annotations get very sort of inconsistent, right? There's, there's, people are going to not do a perfect job. So uh, dealing with all of those issues, is, uh, actually, there's multiple PhD theses written up about this topic. Including some here at Tazak. And it, it, it's, it's obviously a very important problem. If your labels are bad, your model's going to learn something useless. OK, I'm going to spend a couple minutes on the Visipedia project, which is a project led by Pietro Perona, who is a professor here at Delta, working primarily in computer vision. 
So the Visipedia project was motivated by the sort of the, the, the observation that you know we have we encounter visual puzzles every day. You know, we see things in the world, it's one of our primary sensory modalities, and there and there are so many things that we don't understand. You know, if I if there's a mole on my on my, on my skin, is that cancers are benign? Is there any way that you know I could sort of just you know have a good have an educated guess about that just based on the image, but I have to see a doctor who, by the way, is also making an educated guess based on the visual properties of the mole. Um, if I see this tree, what kind of tree is it? If I see this bird, what kind of bird is it? If I see some writings in a different language, what does it say? What kind of writing, what language is it in? And so Pietro's lab had worked on the Wikipedia project. Uh, the initial version of this project was motivated by birds. So give it, if I see an image of a bird, can I just take an image of that? Can I just, if I see a bird, can I take a photo of that bird? And my phone, let's say, would just tell me what kind of bird it was. And so you can download this app on your phone. It's called Merlin Bird ID. Uh, it's in collaboration with the Cornell Lab for Ornithology. And uh, basically, you, you take a photo, you zoom in, you do a little bounding box around the bird, so the annotation you have to provide is just try to localize the subject in the image, and then it tells you the, the top few predictions. It has pretty high accuracy for reasonably high quality photos in uh, North America. So here's just another example. Um, an image of a bird. Uh, and the actual bird is quite blurry. And if you were to feed this image to uh, the Merlin Bird ID app, it would give you the right answer. So you can play with this yourself. It's, uh, you can download it from, uh, it's on both Android and iTunes. And, um, you know, at Pedro's lab, been looking, using this type of technology to do other things, like do tree counting. It turns out that uh, computing a census of trees in Los Angeles is a highly non trivial task. There's something like 200 distinct species of trees. They grow at different rates. Their trunks cause different amounts of damage to the sidewalks. And monitoring these trees and which trees need more monitoring is so expensive that the city of LA can't do it. And so is there a way to just do automatic tree monitoring just from everyday photos that people take? For example, Google Street View. You can actually, you can actually do a full tree census in theory using Google Street View images of the city of LA <coughs> if, you, if you could identify the trees. Okay, so scientifically, why is this interesting? So this is a, this is, these are some great applications. From a research methodological point of view, why is this interesting? Uh, well, first of all, um, in some sense, we're crowdsourcing science, right? In, in some sense, there is no ground truth. Like the fact that we think that these two animals belong to the same species is in some sense a human construct. If you've taken biology, you know that the definition of species is a human, is a human construct. So there is no ground truth. Like the taxonomy of species is a human construct created by scientific consensus. And this is true for so many branches of science and just what we consider knowledge. And so one of the fundamental questions that I, I think is being asked by this direction of research beyond just can we get Turk workers to label, create labels more reliably is how can AI powered systems accelerate science the 21st century. So just, just as one example, um, these apps have actually led to the discovery of new species of animals, in, for example, in South America, where one person trekking through the rainforest or something found this, I think it was a beetle, uploaded the image. There's an expert on beetles, I think, living in Ohio, and categorized, he thinks this is a new beetle, brand new species of beetle, not seen before, Got a bunch of scientists like, involved, I think. and the scientists they came to a consensus that new species of beetle. This actually happened. So this type of technology, for example, is, in, is empowering uh, life scientists studying animals to co co conduct field studies on an unprecedented scale. There's like you know a few dozen beetle experts in the world, and uh, the, the bird version of this bird ID has over 100,000 active users. People like birds. Okay, so here at Caltech, 
Another area that we're looking at is, is, is behavior. So uh, we uh, collaborate with a bunch of biologists, and the biologists manipulate the brains of laboratory animals, and then they want to measure uh, behavioral phenotypes. Behavior is sometimes the most complex phenotype. Uh, for example, if you want to study aggression, if I, if, I, if I hyperactivate this part of the brain, does it lead to more aggressive behavior? Okay, how do you measure aggression? Well, okay, maybe one fly bites another fly more. Okay, what is a bite? Well, we have to agree on what a bite is. Are there three different types of bites? Are there four different types of bites? If, if we see like a rapid succession of biting, is that one long bite or three short bites? These things matter when you're writing a biology paper. Because uh, you know, you could have two biology, biology papers that seem to be based on the same type of experiment and come to completely opposite conclusions. Oh, biting increased or biting decreased. Oh, it depends on how you measure bites. Measuring bites is not trivial. And, and like, people have to agree on that based on video data. So it's, it's an actually, this is actually, and, and, and nowadays we, these type of experiments are being skilled up. We have, like between us and our collaborators, we have something like 20,000 hours of fruit flies biting each other. And, and so like, the, the audience, so the view that able to do AI powered science is actually quite relevant. And again, there's no consensus. There is, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that there is no, sorry, there is no ground truth. You have to come to a scientific consensus. Yes? Um, so what kind of ways do people try to induce a hierarchy with the granularity that we actually speak in? Like I know for, for like healthcare data, for example, that's why I'm supervised. Things just don't work if it comes out with some granularity of phenotype that a doctor would never say it right about. Uh, so we've never done fully unsupervised. Um, right now, what studies? Right now, we're limited to the annotations of only one poor bio grad student. So you get four biology PhD students annotating this data, and you get four different answers about the the labels. I don't know that any of them are wrong, uh, but we need to come to a consensus. And that's actually an open question right now, so I don't know how to answer your question. But also, when you mentioned like species as a construct. Yes. Even if you were looking at not, maybe not the fruitful experiment, but uh -huh. more generally you were trying to find so that something... Right, so the taxonomy of species is a pretty well-defined one with a lot of scientific consensus. So that one maybe is not a super good example in terms of finding consensus, because that... I, I feel like there's only small modifications there. But like here, it's like a brand new area. There's like a few bunch of labs around the United States and Europe and wherever trying to do a, a behavior analysis for modified brains. And, and like we're creating a new taxonomy of behavior of fruit flies on the fly, no pun intended. And and, and, and like it's it's it's, it's, a, it's causing and it really does slow science down without having consensus here. So taxonomy species that's something we studied for like what two hundred years, hundred years, something like that. That one maybe is less relevant because it's pretty codified and only minor minor modifications. But here it's like wild wild west and like no one agrees and we want to use AI to accelerate that. What if you wanted to find out where you were in the like an existing taxonomy. Ah, but you don't really have access to the labels of where it is, but you, you're trying to sort through that hierarchy. I don't have access to the labels. So maybe in an unsuper maybe you had a bunch of animals and you wanted to learn where their, their hierarchical relationships were. In an unsupervised you, manner. In an unsupervised manner. But you don't know like that this is species five. Right, okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes, yeah. so, so okay, people have done this uh, with their DNA sequences. That's the only way you can really do that without, in an unsupervised way because you look at the edit distance of the DNA sequences. Um, and so people do some sort of hierarchical clustering where the breakpoints can, some, some subset of the breakpoints of the hierarchical clustering are the species delineations. You just hope that that happens. I'm or sorry. You just hope that those delineations occur, or can you like inject it? So I'm not an expert in this field. Um, I don't work in this field, and I think you'll get different answers from different people. I think the people who really study these methods will say yes. I think someone like me might might be more skeptical. Okay, I'm going to move on to a related topic in active learning. So in crowdsourcing, we have uh, someone like me who needs labels for my experiments. I have a huge data set of unlabeled data, and I have a small data set of labeled data, initially empty. And then I have an image from my, or, or an example from my unlabeled data set. Uh, I pay a little bit of money to, a crowd, uh, to an annotator 
who creates a label, which I get to add it to my label data set. Now, I am a poor professor, and I have very little money. And so I want to do this while minimizing cost. So, uh, yeah, this thing repeats. So, passive learning basically says I'm going to sample from my own label data set uniformly at random, IID sampling, and I'm going to create, collect labels uniformly at random. Active learning says, well, given what I have so far in my label data set, I'm going to proactively choose an example to be labeled that may will not no longer be drawn IID for my own label data distribution. Um, yeah, so the hope is that the hope is that um, we can train a classifier on our label data set that is maximally accurate with minimal cost in collecting labels. Of course, the uh, ID assumption has been broken. So we can no longer assume that this label, this training set was, this was sampled ID from the true distribution. It was not. Um, but that's something we have to cope with in order to get this benefit. So on-demand crowdsourcing is something that another professor here at Caltech, Aniwa Kumar, worked on uh, when she was a visiting scientist at Amazon Web Services. And the basic idea is that you could be training a giant neural net on an unlabeled data set. And you basically, as you're processing your unlabeled data set, you can choose what to annotate. Um, if you, could, you, could, you could request an annotator to annotate this data example based on your current training of neural nets. So you're doing gradient. I'm just doing, I'm streaming data through my giant neural net. I'm doing stochastic gradient descent selectively on a subset of the data that's being streamed over. Um, and uh, and that, that's sort of the idea. So imagine I'm getting a stream of data, it's all unlabeled, or, or only an initial subset is labeled. And then I choose whether or not, if, as I see another data, set, data example in my stream, to have a label. If I, if, it's not, if I don't label it, then I'm, I'm not going to do gradient descent because I don't have the label. If I choose to label it, then I can do gradient descent. So these types of ideas have become increasingly popular in many commercial applications where they're training very large models uh, with, uh, without necessarily having all the labels up front. And it's very expensive to collect all the labels up front. So this something like this might be much uh, might be much more efficient in terms of cost. So comparison with passive learning. So conventional supervised learning, which is what we cover in this class, is considered passive learning in the sense that the data is given to a we in the sense that we the learner receives the data passively. In other words, the, um, the data set is sampled according to the test distribution, IID. And so this is very expensive. So to show the analogy in one dimension, suppose we were learning a, suppose our, our learning problem was a 1D learning problem, one dimensional learning problem, we want to learn a threshold function. So then we sample data uniformly from this distribution, so this is our data, and then we learn this threshold. So this is a very simple learning problem just to illustrate the, the point. And this is our true model in red. And we could say something about how close we can expect to be from our true model given how we're given some number of samples. Okay. In active learning, in this simple example where everything's noise free, so there's no noise in the labels, uh, it basically reduces the binary search. So you first hypothesize that the, that the that this threshold is in the middle. You query, you actively query it for a data point in the middle. You get a label. Based on that label, you query, you query the bisection of the remaining uncertainty region. So the true label, the true threshold must be between this interval. So I'm going to choose the bisector, query that label, and so on and so forth. And so you can show in this very simplified learning setting, super simplified learning setting, that if you want to get within y minus, if you want to get within epsilon of the true model. Well, epsilon is the difference, distance between the true model and the estimated model. For passive learning, you need to have the order of 1 over epsilon. For active learning, you need to on the order of log of 1 over epsilon. So you're exponentially faster in terms of the number of labels needed. Okay, multi-armed bandits. So 
look at what are some problems with crowdsourcing. One of the fundamental problems with crowdsourcing is that you, you can acquire labels by proxy. Right? So if someone else <coughs> labels objects in an image, that's basically how I would label objects in the image. And you know, there, there are questions of some consensus of, of truth and stuff like that that comes with uh, this territory. But sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes, like for example, in personalized recommender systems, I would never crowdsource someone else to provide a label about what kind of movies I like. It doesn't make any sense. In, the, in this type of scenario, like the consensus has no meaning. I want everything to be personalized. So personalized medicine is another example. Okay, so what does that mean? That means you cannot collect labels by proxy. You must collect labels from the target that you are you know, going to make predictions to. At least in this very simple setting. So what does that mean in the sort of the metaphor that we've been using uh, thus far? Suppose we're recommending articles, news articles, so sports and otherwise. And so we, 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 we show the end user, so one of us, uh, an article or a song or whatever. And then, our, and then the user provides some sort of feedback, let's say thumbs up, thumbs down, just for simplicity. And then that's a label now, right? We know that this user liked this article, or liked this movie, or liked this whatever. Or thumbs down. Okay, that's interesting. Well, so how do we measure cost? Um, so cost here isn't really money anymore, necessarily. Because the user is using this system for some other, from, from some, from, for some other purpose. Enjoyment, better health, outcomes, something else. Okay, so here's the formal definition. Suppose that we have k categories of stuff that we could recommend. And for each user, for any individual particular user, that each of these actions has an average reward of, or utility, if you will, of use of k, that is unknown to us, the recommender system. So then, at every iteration, uh, the recommender system would choose one of the actions. So I recommend you a sports article or a politics article. And then the user tells us thumbs up, thumbs down. And the expected value of that feedback is equal to mu sub k, which we don't observe, but we need to estimate. And the typical way that people quantify performance is through a notion called regret, uh, where if we had perfect information to start, in this simplified scenario, we would select from the first category the entire time because that has the maximum expected utility. But since we don't have perfect information, we have to actually um, try out and suggest a bunch of other actions and get feedback in order to figure out what the user likes. So this is the expected reward of the behavior of the recommender algorithm, and this is the expected reward of having all the knowledge that we need to know up front. And the difference between the two is known as regret. So here's a more cartoon, interactive sort of example. <clears throat> so in this example, we have um, five categories of news articles. And we're, rec we're trying to personalize to the preferences of this particular user. So our system on day one recommends an article about sports. And the user says, nah, I don't like it. So what have we learned about the user? We've learned that we've shown the user one article on sports, and the user didn't like it. <coughs> Day two, we recommend to the user an article on politics. I initially made these slides pre-2016. And then the user says, yeah, I like this article. Um, and so that's so we, we learned something about the user. And we've also known that we uh, the user has accumulated one unit of utility from interacting with our recommender system because the user liked this article. The next one, we recommend an article about world news, user doesn't like it, and so on and so forth. And I suppose this, is, this has happened for a while. We've recommended a bunch of different articles. The user has liked them at varying probabilities. The user has accumulated 24 units of utility from interacting with our system. At this point in time, what the question is, what should the algorithm recommend? So on the, other, on the one hand, we can see from the data that we've already collected from this user that it seems like the probability of the user liking an article about the economy is the highest, 44%. So perhaps we should recommend an article about economics. 
On the other hand, we must recognize that we've actually you know, collected very little data about this user. You know, in particular, like we've, we haven't collected any single articles, uh, it's recommended any single articles about celebrity news, so we have no idea the extent to which this user likes articles about celebrity news. And so the other action that we could do, called, called explore, is to recommend an article whose subsequent feedback will maximally improve our estimate of the user. And if we sort of knew with the benefit of hindsight that this user likes politics the best, has an act, it actually has the highest probability of being liked, you know, which is plausible here, right? So we recommend a 10, we do a 4. It's possible that the true probability is higher than the true probability of this one. How do we actually converge to this as quickly as possible while not sacrificing on intermediate utility because the user is interacting with the system the entire time? And in other words, how do we optimally balance the exploration exploitation trade off? And this is characterized by the multi arm problem. So, you know, on day one, our algorithm, the optimal algorithm with perfect knowledge of the user would recommend an article about politics and we'd recommend something else. We'd get different rewards. On day two, we have to recommend an article on politics, so we get the same reward, and so on and so forth, and at least an expectation. And so regret is basically the difference. And you can think of regret as the opportunity cost of not knowing the user's preferences a priori. And so algorithms that are very efficient in the regret sense converge to no regret very quickly. So it doesn't overexplore. It doesn't get stuck in recommending suboptimal actions for others. Uh, this is the formal definition. So why is it called the multi arm bandit problem? Well, it was, here's one of the motivating reasons. So um, as many of you or some of you know, uh, a slot machine at a casino is called a one arm bandit. And so the multi arm bandit problem was motivated, the name was motivated by the idea of you go to a casino, there are K slot machines, each one has a different payoff, but you don't know what it is. So how do you play these K slot machines while losing money as slowly as possible? Without knowing their initial payoffs. So the regret from pulling some off the Mars is the multi band problem, minimizing that. <coughs> uh, let's get this slide in the interest of time. Uh, there's a connection to experiment design, so, such as those in clinical trials. So, uh, one question in experiment design is how do we split the trials to collect information? In a static experiment design, which is what's industry standard, the experiment design is pre planned. So, what does that mean? Uh, we have a treatment, we have an experimental treatment. The first person, in this case a patient, uh, comes to our center and we flip a random coin and we give this person the treatment. The second person comes to our center, we flip a random coin. And we give this person the placebo, and so on and so forth. Now let's say the split is 50-50, and the 50-50 split is pre-planned. And then after some period of time, we have confidence in that, let's say, the treatment is better than the placebo, in which case we would switch to just apply the treatment to everyone in practice. Okay, so you can think of what we just described as adaptive experimental design. So we're going to adapt our experiment design based on outcomes. So first person comes to our center, receives the uh, treatment, and we observe a positive outcome. Second person receives the placebo, we observe a negative outcome. Third person receives the treatment, and we observe a positive outcome. At this point, our model may, may start to suspect that perhaps the treatment might be effective. Not a lot of evidence. But we have some evidence that the treatment might be effective, and perhaps we should bias the future experiments to be more towards the treatment than the placebo. And this has reward implications. So there's a news article from about uh, uh, eight or nine years ago. These are two cousins. They both have were, uh, uh, were diagnosed with a very aggressive form of um, melanoma, cancer, type of cancer. And it was known by the doctors that the standard chemotherapy was ineffective. And there was a new drug, experimental drug, that seemed promising in you know, prolonging healthy lifespans of these uh, of people suffering from cancer. It was a clinical trial. One of the cousins got the experiment. The other one got 
the chemo, the control. One of them died within a month, the other one lived an extra year. So these things matter. Uh, in other words, in static, in, in static experiment design, uh, the goal is, you know, if you're, if you're a statistician, the goal is, I want to design this experiment so that at the conclusion of my experiment, I have the best information possible to uh, make decisions about for future patients. For adaptive experiment design, we say, well, okay, actually the people in the experiment matter too. And so we want to minimize regret. There are lots of logistical policy and other uh, hurdles that one would need to overcome in order to actually apply adaptive experiment design in the, in the natural clinical trial. And I'm, and I'm oversimplifying a lot of things for the purpose of making the, 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 the for the purpose of doing the thought experiment. So it's a lot more complicated practice, but I just want to make this, I just want to run through this thought experiment with you guys. Okay, so another thing that's related is uh, automated experiment design for you know, uh, science or engineering. So, you know, uh, if you, if, if, you know, typically how, how science works these days is some brilliant scientists and their team of PhD students discover some property of nature, uh, some attribute that seems to be interesting and unobserved before. That's a nature paper, and the universities declare victory. Um, there's a hypothesis space of, of results related to, inspired by this result, and one of those results is actually useful. This is actually a medicine that we can use. And the path is long and arduous and expensive. This is one of the reasons why and, uh, drug discovery is so incredibly expensive these days. It's getting harder and harder to convert the nature paper to a useful result as the hypothesis space expands and expands. And so can we use these types of concepts for adaptive experiment design to accelerate this process to some degree? Um, let's see. Uh, right. Uh, let me just skip this one. Um, so, uh, more broadly in the world, um, the the uh, the largest use case for multi arm bandits and adaptive experiment design is actually in advertising. So every time you uh, do a search on Google, every time you uh, open up your Facebook feed and there's a ad, bunch of ads on the side. Every time you go to the NewYorkTimes.com and there's a banner ad on top, all of those are subject to adaptive experiment design. So when a new ad, when an advertiser submits a new ad, which happens all the time, we have no idea how good this ad is, who this ad would appeal to, which which persons or users would have the maximal probability of clicking on this ad. The only, way we, the only way we would know is if we show the ad. But then if we show the ad and the user doesn't click on it, we lose money as the advertising platform. But if we never show the ad, we don't, we'll don't. we never know if it's you know, really good. So this is an exploration exploitation trade-off. And in fact, it is exactly characterized by the multi-term banner problem, at least a simplified version of it. And the multi-term banner problem actually drives all in advertising. Is one of the engines that drives personalized online advertising. Uh, yes? So for these adaptive experiment designs, there's like a lot of statistical ways that people have done it for That's a long right. time. Like where do you see ML stuff kind of? Yeah, so I mean, there's a huge overlap. So for example, um, uh, a lot of Lion Robbins, um, okay, Gitt Gittins, maybe you know, Gitt these are all statisticians. So they, they work out that experiment design. So, um, so, so to, to, to a large extent, these algorithms that we've developed builds upon, um, uh, builds upon the ideas coming out of the statistical literature over the last 50 years. One of the key issues um, is that uh, if you think about the ways people framed, and I, I'm, I'm saying this in general, I'm speaking generalities now. The way people in statistics framed experiment design from like you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it's, they're very carefully trying to tease out maximal statistical power from like a really pretty small set of experiments. 
So as n goes to infinity, or t goes to infinity, what is the big O scaling factor of the statistical strength of my experiment design? <clears throat> that was less studied in statistics. And so the computer science community picked up some of the stuff that people were looking at in statistics and asked the question, okay, but in the lim infinite limit of running a sequence of experiments as the sequence goes to infinity, what is the big O scaling factor? So that's the, that's the, 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 the painting a very broad strokes comparison. That would, that would be the, the primary difference. And that, of course, has a series of implications for Google, which runs some, I don't know, I don't even know, something like a billion experiments a day. I don't know. Yeah, every, every, every time you search Google, they run an experiment. So things with maybe like a lot of data and feedback are going to be the, the faster updates. Yeah, so you know, if, yeah, so uh, that being one, and the other one being just like, what is the asymptotic performance of this algorithm? Like, how do I collect experiments knowing that I'm going to run more experiments? So if I collect experiments knowing that I'm going to run more experiments in the future, that's a different algorithm than ignoring that fact. So if you go to, so every time you choose a class to take through your undergrad, it's an experiment. You don't know if you'll like the history class. You don't know if you'll like the art class. But you choose to, I mean, this is a this analogy is imperfect, but um, but that's kind of like the medical example. Like you only choose classes like eight times in undergrad or something, right? Yeah, and it's in the limit of like going to school forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in the limit of going to school forever, uh, you know, how do you plan? Uh, you know, plan it out. So you know, I don't know if I'll like this class, but I'll take it my freshman year in case I really like it, and then I'm gonna take more than ever. So are you saying that the statistics things would be better if you know that there's this n number of times that you're going to take steps and that n is small? So like for example, like you know, like combinatorial experiment design says I, I'm going to run like I, I'm going to design this experiment. It's going to have like a hundred things. I'm going to run a set of hundred experiments. I have these like ten hypotheses that I want to test. I want to design these hundred experiments in a way that I can test all ten simultaneously. So that, this is a very classic statistics experiment design problem in statistics. That has a like the, the the types of the part of the math that you need to innovate on is very different than I'm going to run a sequence of experiments and this sequence could be a hundred thousand and I want to make sure that the asymptotic experiment the convergence of the maximum information I get the asymptotics are, are good. Yeah. They're very related. I mean, I shouldn't I like they have more in common than than than, than, than differences. I should say. There's, yeah, the, the, the mathematics have more in common than. than Differences, but the differences become important when you're trying to do Google scale uh, monetization. It can make a difference between like an extra billion dollars. Okay, I am running short on time. So, um, yeah, so at Caltech, we work on personalization for medical treatments. So, um, this is a patient who has a spinal column injury, he cannot stand on his own power. And Bill Burdick has been working with people at various medical schools, including UCLA Medical School, to um, implant this uh, uh, epidural electrostimulator inside the spinal column uh, to stimulate this patient so that he can regain some lower limb mobility, but you have to personalize to the patient. So we actually treated this as a banded problem, and we get results like this. So this patient um, has been paralyzed for two years. And this is his first time standing with help of this type of uh, treatment. Um, uh, I do some work with Francis Arnold on uh, banded type experiment design for protein engineering. Um, I work with Harry Atwater on banded type experiments for um, material design. Sorry, I'm just running a little short on time. Uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, the, in reinforcement learning, uh, it's very similar to multi-arm bandits. The, the biggest difference, and it's a huge difference, but the, 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 the single diff big difference is that in multi-arm bandits, the actions do not impact the state. What that means is that the multi-arm bandit problem is a stateless problem. In reinforcement learning, the, in, the actions impact the state that you're in. So, you, there's, so there's different states, and there's different actions depending, the actions take you to different states, and the reward function depends on the state you're in. There's no single constant expected utility function. 
So um, I'll skip the video. You, maybe you've probably seen it for Planet Atari. Uh, in Atari, uh, you know, the state is basically the, 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 the screenshot of the game. So the action you take impacts the state that you're in. The reward you get is different from the state you're in. Uh, you get the same exploration exploitation trade-off, but now in a stateful way rather than a stateless way. So that exploration is much harder to do. Imitation learning is like um, reinforcement learning, except that we get demonstrations. So it's more like supervised learning where someone tells us what to do. But again, it's, it's, it's got this stateful flavor to it, similar to reinforcement learning. I do a lot of work in imitation learning. A lot of it is tied to sports analytics, where we get uh, trajectory data from the NBA. So this is actual trajectory data from the NBA. I'm going to show you the slide before. And the idea is to can we demonstrate can we imitate these demonstrations to produce realistic basketball gameplay? Uh, so you get examples like this. So you try to build uh, basketball simulators that look realistic. The one on the left is our approach, the one on the right is a baseline. Um, you can show multiple levels of decision making. So the squares are the macro goals. There's a probabilistic aspect of this, especially if you're modeling offense. You want the offense to be, un uh, to be uh, unpredictable. So there's actually there's a, there's a notion of, as Joe Burrito mentioned, there's, a, there's actually there's a there's this, this is actually a recurrent deep generative model in the sequential decision making regime, um, and so on and so forth. I think this is the last topic. Oh my, I have a lot to cover. Uh, I guess people ask a lot of questions, huh? <laughs> um, so I will. Uh, so and Nibano and Cooper works on non-convex optimization, and let me just skip. Um, uh, let me just skip to this slide. So uh, the the biggest question in uh, in non-convex optimization these days is, how, what about deep learning? So how do we analyze the optimization uh, of deep learning? And one thing that people have started looking at. This is just one question amongst many. Is can we look at the spectral properties of deep learning? Uh, the spectral so a deep neural net is um, is a sequence of matrix multiplies and a layer of non of a non and a layer of nonlinear activation functions, matrix multiplies, and so if we analyze the singular values of these weight matrices, and what can what can that tell us about the optimization the geometry of the optimization landscape? What can that tell us about the generalization properties of these neural nets? Uh, so this is just one angle amongst many that people are taking in this really rich area of studying optimization and generalization in deep learning. And Anima works on this. Uh, many more topics, probabilistic evasion modeling, representation learning, causal reasoning, uh, machine learning plus game theory, uh, machine learning and big data systems, fairness, privacy, the list goes on and on. Uh, I just want to make a short plug for Katie Bowman. Katie is a new faculty joining at the end of May. Uh, and her thesis work at MIT and her postdoc work at Harvard is on imaging the black hole. So to build a telescope that can resolve the black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, the telescope would need to be roughly the diameter of the Earth, which is physically impossible, at least as far as I know. So what people do, is they take telescopes around the Earth, right, like these, and you can think of those as little point measurements of a giant telescope. So I have a little. So instead of instead of a single giant telescope, I only see little points, and somehow, and I want to be able to somehow reconstruct what the original full telescope would have seen. And so this so this uses a combination of Bayesian inference, noise and measurements, physics. Uh, and and, uh, and so a lot of a lot of uh, you know combining physics-based models with Bayesian inference. Um, CS159, uh, the topic of CS159, which is taught this spring, um, and, and the topics rotate every term, every year. Excuse me. The topic of this uh, spring is deep generative models. So you saw a lecture on deep generative models given by Joe Marino, your TA, uh, from the class. And so we'll touch on probabilistic models proper inference, proper sampling, and how to incorporate the traditional notions of uh, modeling, inference, and sampling, and embedding neural nets and deep learning 
into these functions so that they can capture much richer distributions than those that we can uh, capture classically. Um, it's, uh, the, it's basically a structured as a paper reading and, and presenting class, so students will read papers, uh, contemporary research, present them in class, and then the bulk of the, le the, the grade will be on a final research project. Okay, any questions in the remaining one or two minutes? Yes? If I had to pick one? <laughs> so I think half of my group right now works at the intersection of learning and control. So how do we actually put neural nets on an airplane and prove that it's safe for them? That's the pitch. Um, how do we put a neural net on your Boeing 777 to get better fuel economy and have the pilot take a nap and reduce costs and smoother landings and all that stuff that you, you, you'd like to see? and prove that it won't crash the plane. <laughs> uh, maybe even design a better aircraft. Um, so, you know, certain, so black, combining black box learning with certified models and integrating the two in a way that preserves the certification while improving some notion of optimality. So I have my group works on that. Uh, I, I am super fascinated with uh, causal reasoning. So, um, Although I have done, I've done no work on it. Uh, but I'm super fascinated by it because we, we are beginning to see learning-based approaches integrated in our society. The US government uses these learning-based approaches to recommend parole, to recommend prison sentences. Uh, companies use these learning-based approaches to filter out applications, <coughs> rank who should, we should interview. Um, uh, yeah, these the insurance companies use these learning-based systems to recommend who, like, who to give insurance to at what rate, based on various risk factors. Now, a lot of people in fairness and privacy care a lot about this for, from a specific perspective, because you know, if you learn from bias, because the data wasn't collected IID, I didn't do random sampling. Of, I'm going to try giving this person parole and see if they, can, you know. It wasn't, the data wasn't collected from, from random sampling, the data was collected as the out, outcome of a pre-existing policy. And the extent to which the pre-existing policy is biased, the data will be biased. So we're literally suffering from algorithmic confirmation bias. So certain zip codes get policed more, so predictive policing is a thing now, minority report, stuff like that's happening a little bit. Um, and so fairness is an issue. Um, but I think more fundamentally than fairness, the issue is causality. Did, did, did we arrest more people from the zip code because of some issue with the zip code? Or did it because we just sent more police cars into the zip code and therefore led to more arrests? Or the policemen were more aggressive in this zip code? That's, a, that's an issue that people in fairness care about. But I, I actually think more fundamentally, just if you think about science in general, the issue is causality. And on, again, on the other hand, the people who work on causal reasoning, they typically work with these really semantically well-defined variables. Like if you've ever taken a causality class, it's like the, the, cur the actual temperature of today and the thermometer reading, and which one caused the other one. That's, that's sort of the experiment. You don't see the temperature reading on the thermometer. You see, a, you see a photo with pixels that somehow gets reconstructed into a thermometer reading, right? And so in the real world, you get this messy raw data and somehow you have to distill that into a semantically meaningful variable that you can do causal reasoning. So in other words, maybe combine deep, deep learning or representation learning with classical causal inference to truly to get it to work at scale to address some of the societal scale problems that we're facing now that machine learning based approaches are becoming more and more used in society relevant applications. But I've done no work on it. I've done no work on it. There's just, that, that, that was something that I really want to get into. Okay, that's it. Thanks, sorry for going over time.